everyone joining us this morning via live stream for the April 29th, 2021 Joint Colorado River Shortage Preparedness Briefing. Behind the mask, I'm Ted Cook, CAP General Manager, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Tom Bushatsky, Director of the Arizona Department of Water Resources. I would also like to introduce Dan Bunk, who is here with us today, Chief of the Bureau of Reclamation's Boulder Canyon Operations Office, who will be providing an overview of the Colorado River status later in the presentation. Out of respect for all of our safety, we are hosting this meeting virtually. Similar to how CAWCD board meetings have been conducted since mid-March of 2020. We are adhering to appropriate social distancing protocols and for those who are here at CAWCD headquarters, staff are all wearing masks when needed. The CAP campus is closed to visitors, but the meeting is being broadcast via live stream for the public. This meeting is being hosted at CAP, but I would like to recognize the collaborative effort that went into our briefing today by both ADWR and the Bureau of Reclamation. Today we'll, we, we will provide an update on the current status of the Colorado River, an overview of Arizona's plan to address the likelihood of shortage in 2022, some of the key implementation actions, how shortage will affect water users, and we will also have some time at the end for questions. The public may submit comments or questions at any time during the meeting by completing the online public comment form at www.cap-az.com forward slash shortage feedback. It's on the slide that's on the screen right now. We will have a call to the public at the end of the meeting and will address comments or questions at that time unless there is a question during the meeting to clarify something in the presentation. Today's meeting is being recorded and meeting materials will be posted on the information pages on the ADWR and CAP websites and those websites are shown on the slide. Tom and I will also be available after the meeting for a press event. We're getting into the content now. Uh, many of these slides are um, somewhat dense as far as information goes and Tom and I and other presenters, Dan, will do our best to uh, make this as clear as possible. The reason we're meeting today is that Lake Mead is 38% full and that is uh, shown uh, with the, I think, um, the, well, where the, where the blue the blue shading in the teacup diagram there is right above the tier one line at 1075. It's 38% full and only five feet above the end of the year tier one shortage, shortage trigger elevation of uh, 1075 feet. In a moment, Dan Bunk from the Bureau of Reclamation will provide the latest forecast, but we can tell you that it looks highly likely that we will be in a tier one shortage in 2022. Now, that determination won't be made with finality until the official announcement at, in conjunction with the August 24 month study, but under the rules agreed to in 2007, the 2007 interim guidelines, if we are projected to be below 1075 at the end of the year in August, April will take a 320,000 acre foot reduction plus the additional mandatory contribution of 192,000 acre feet under the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan, or DCP. So in total, that's 512,000 acre feet, and we will discuss the details and implications of that reduction in this presentation today. It is important to note that this is a day we knew would come at some point, meaning um, tier one shortage. Um, and as we will discuss, it, this is later than um, it otherwise would have been without these programs that we just referred to. And we have been preparing for this moment for uh, at least a couple of decades. The chart you're seeing now, I think is familiar to a lot of people because we've been showing this for years. This chart shows the change in Lake Mead elevation over the past two decades. Uh, since basically, uh, since 2020 when um, uh, Lake Mead was essentially full. Some of the key milestones are shown there in the, in the text boxes beginning with the lowest recorded unregulated inflow to Lake Powell that was in 2002. And uh, 2021 is giving us a run for the money on that particular uh, record. 
Uh, I don't believe anyone in 2002 would look at that and think that this would become a more common occurrence than it, it had been up to that point. This was a stark reminder of the variability and risks in the Colorado River system, and it marked the onset of the current drought, uh, which of course now has endured for more than two decades. In 2007, the seven basin states completed the, the 2007 guidelines, recognizing the need for more certainty regarding reservoir operations. This was followed by the 2012 basin study, which identified increasing vulnerability in the system and a landmark agreement with Mexico referred to as Minute 319. This is a, a basically an amendment to the 1944 treaty with Mexico that included sharing of surpluses and shortage on the river with Mexico. In 2014, we began cooperative targeted conservation programs in Lake Mead, including the pilot system conservation program, which initiated voluntary contributions to Lake Mead. In 2017, we expanded the agreement with Mexico under Minute 323 to share additional reductions as a precursor to the drought contingency plans that were adopted in 2019. Collectively in Arizona, including DCP Tier 0 operations in 2021. And just to be clear for a moment, Tier 0 was the additional reductions that were uh, created by the drought contingency plan that were put on top of the Tier 1, 2, and 3 reductions that were implemented in the 2007 guidelines. So collectively in Arizona, including drought contingency plan Tier 0 operations in 2021 and voluntary contributions in earlier years, Arizona has contributed more than 1.8 million acre feet to Lake Mead between 2014 and 2021, or about 22 feet in Lake Mead. Coordinated and collaborative actions by water users in Arizona, California, Nevada, and Mexico, including the implementation of the DCP, contributed to avoiding shortages in 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. And so like I said earlier, we would already be in 2007 guideline shortage, probably tier two by now, if it wasn't for these earlier actions. As you will learn further today, we have developed innovative conservation and cooperation agreements, which will be, be deployed under tier one conditions, which are likely to happen in 2022. Again, that's the reason for today's meeting. Which brings us to the present and our current preparation efforts. And there's not starting today, these have been going on um, since DCP was implemented. As you can see on the timeline shown on this chart, we are engaged in a coordinated effort working with affected stakeholders to be prepared for the possibility of a tier one shortage in 2022. Again, that, will be, that decision will be finalized in August of this year. Since the shortage impacts fall almost exclusively to CAP water users, this timeline has a heavy emphasis on CAP and its water users, but these steps involve close collaboration with ADWR and the Bureau of Reclamation. And to that matter, all, uh, all uh, CAP water users and many sectors of water users across Arizona who collaborated to put the DCP uh, in place. And in large part, our preparation efforts will be to basically remind everyone of all the moving pieces that need to be implemented once we enter into a tier one shortage. To that point, today's meeting comes just two weeks after Reclamation published the April 24-month study, which is a forecast that plays an important role in Colorado River management. To provide more detail on that study and related data, I will ask Dan Bunk, Chief of the Boulder Canyon Operations Office, Bureau of Reclamation, to um, take over the presentation. Dan. Uh, thank you, Ted. and. Uh... Thank you to CAP and ADWR for the opportunity to uh, present today. And uh, good morning to everyone. Um, I, I do not have a mask on because I'm working from home today like many of us still are um, in, in uh, the federal government. Um, but we are looking forward to the, the day that we can start to meet with one another again in person. Um, but I do appreciate the, the virtual environment as a way to continue to uh, <clears throat> coordinate with one another. Um, today, I'd like to give a brief update on the Colorado River Basin current conditions and our operational projections. Next slide, please. Uh, so currently, uh, for Colorado River Basin storage, 
Uh, Lake Powell is currently at 35% of capacity. Uh, that's about eight and a half million acre feet in storage uh, at an elevation of 3563. And for perspective, the full pool elevation for Lake Powell is 3,700 acre feet. So it's about 140 feet below full pool right now. Um, Lake Mead is currently at 38% full, as Ted mentioned, with about 10 million acre feet in storage and at an elevation of 1080. And uh, similarly, uh, Lake Mead is also about 140 feet uh, below its full pool elevation of about 10, uh, 1220. Uh, total system storage, which includes Lake Powell and Lake Mead and other system, system reservoirs in the Colorado River Basin is 43%. Uh, at this time last year, um, total system storage was about 52%, so it's gone down about 10% since last year. Um, and for perspective, uh, Lake Powell's elevation has declined uh, by about 35 feet or so since this time last year, and Lake Mead's elevation has declined by about uh, 15, 16 feet or so uh, since this time last year, so both reservoirs have unfortunately uh, have declined. <clears throat> Uh, next slide, please. So the reason for this decline is primarily the hydrology. Uh, last year, the inflow in the basin was only 54% of average. Uh, this year, uh, the forecasted inflow uh, for uh, inflow into Lake Powell is 41% of average. <clears throat> so the, the plot on this chart, um, it shows the snowpack accumulation trend um, in a normal year, uh, which is the darker line on the slide, um, what occurred last year, um, which is the red line, if you can see the color on the slide, uh, and then the, the line that's sort of incomplete because we're still in the snowpack runoff season is the blue line on the slide, and that's the lowest line on the slide. And so even though the snowpack peaked at about 89% of median on March 30th this year, uh, there's been historically dry conditions, in particular in some of those sub-basins um, in the upper Colorado River Basin. Uh, the the, snow, the, the uh, soil moisture conditions have been at near record levels uh, throughout the upper basin. And <clears throat> that and the fact that the, uh, the snow melt has started to run off a couple weeks early this year, so that's been one of the uh, one of the things we've seen in many of these years when we've had low runoff is that um, these drier soil conditions leading up to the, uh, the runoff season, as well as uh, the early runoff due to the warmer temperatures. And so this all kind of combines to, to where we don't get the, the same efficiency in the runoff than we, than we would have otherwise. And so even though the snowpack peaked at about 89% of median, um, due to dry conditions that have really extended over the past two years, uh, the inflow is only forecasted at 41% of average. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows Lake Powell inflow uh, starting in 1964 when Lake Powell initially started filling um, through 2021. Um, on the on the right side of the chart, you can see a red bar, a green bar, and a darker blue bar. Those are the three inflow forecasts for water year 2021 um, into Lake Powell. Um, that green bar is the most probable forecast. That's that 41% of average that I mentioned on the previous slide. And then there's still some uncertainty, although as time goes on, that uncertainty gets smaller because now we'll start to realize uh, that snow melt runoff um, as we go through this April through July period. But one of the key things to note that if you, if you can read the bottom of the chart, um, uh, water year 2020 is about in the middle of a chart. That's when the drought started. Since the drought started, we've only had five years of above, above average inflow. Um, but this 22 year period since 2000, it's the driest 22 year period on record. And one of the driest, if you go back a thousand years and look at the paleo reconstructed record. Um, and then we've also had the two driest 10 year periods 
within this 22 year period. Um, so we, we had a few years, um, at, you know, starting about 2014 through 2019, where the inflow was closer to average, but um, really the drought has intensified significantly in the last uh, three or four years. And as Ted mentioned, we might not be quite as dry as we were in 2002 by the time this year is done, but it's on pace to be, you know, about the third or fourth driest year in the 100 year record. So um, very, a very poor runoff uh, for this year. Next slide, please. So this slide shows a teacup diagram of Lake Powell and Lake Mead based on our April 24 month study projections. Um, the importance of the April 24 month study is that when Lake Powell's operating in what's called the upper elevation balancing tier, um, there's the potential for an adjustment in April, um, which could result in an increase in Lake Powell's uh, release. Um, that didn't happen this year uh, due to the, uh, lo the low runoff forecasted. Uh, the, re the release this year is uh, set now at 8.23 million acre feet. Um, but we're also projecting a 7.48 million acre feet foot release from Powell in water year 2022, uh, which would be the only the second time this has occurred uh, since the guidelines were implemented. <clears throat> and looking at the, the projections, <clears throat> uh, Lake Powell's uh, end of calendar year elevation is projected to be about 3550. That would put uh, Lake Powell in the mid elevation release here with a 7.48 million acre foot release in 2022. And Lake Mead's projected end of year elevation is 1067.24, which would be a tier one uh, shortage condition in the lower basin. Um, these are based on the April projections. We don't make those determinations um, until, until August, um, but it definitely were given that the hydrology has only been decreasing rather than increasing, it seems uh, very likely um, at this point. Uh, next slide, please. So under this tier one condition, uh, I have a chart here that shows the combined reductions and savings contributions that the US and Mexico would make under the various uh, operating agreements. Uh, the red bar um, on, or the red box on the chart that's the, that's the uh, reductions that would occur um, under a uh, tier one condition. And if you kind of look on the, uh, the, the, the right side of the chart again, where it shows the combined volumes of the shortage reductions and the savings contributions or the total reductions, uh, you can see Arizona's total of 512,000 acre feet, Nevada's total of 21,000 acre feet, and then the green column is Mexico's total of 80,000 acre feet. And in total, uh, basin-wide, uh, the reductions would be about 613,000 acre feet. And again, this is based on the April projection. Um, we make this determination uh, in August for, for the upcoming year in 2022. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of uh, reclamation's timeline of next steps as we prepare for a potential 2022 shortage condition, um, we've already begun outreach and coordination uh, with some Colorado River water users, um, in particular uh, those priority four and priority five uh, users, um, which include the CAP, some on river water users and tribes. Uh, with mainstream priorities, and then also coordination with the uh, state of Nevada and SNWA. Um, we do recognize that there's another, like a, another um, a process which relates to um, coordination with uh, uh, entities such as CAP tribes that receive uh, CAP water. Um, by June 1st, we will be notifying uh, those those entities of the projected water supply condition in 2022. Um, in August, at around August 16th or so, uh, we'll be publishing our August 24 month study and then <clears throat> sending out a notification of the tier one shortage condition to uh, water users, um, assuming that, the, that 
that that is the the notification or the what the August study projects. Um, we'll request 2022 water orders in the August to mid September timeframe. Uh, review the water orders and conduct our annual meetings uh, through November, and then finalize uh, the water orders at the end of the year and continuing outreach and coordination throughout this process. So that's my last slide, and I'll pass it back to uh, Tom to, con to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And as always, we thank you and the Bureau of Reclamation for being such good partners with the state of Arizona and making these types of presentations for us. It's really important that you show that solidarity with us uh, to address the challenges that you talked about. So I'm going to focus mainly on Arizona's drought uh, contingency implementation plan. But first, I'm gonna briefly talk about the lower basin and other drought contingency plans among the states and Mexico. So the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan is designed to reduce the risk of critically low Lake Mead elevations. It's collective actions among all the basin states, the US and Mexico. And even as Dan said, with these increased conservation efforts, a tier one shortage was expected eventually and planned for. So the Arizona plan that Ted and I will review, be reviewing is related to the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan, or the DCP, and the 2007 guidelines that were mentioned earlier. The Lower Basin DCP is a set of shortage sharing agreements among Arizona, California, Nevada, and the United States that adds to the shortage guidelines put in place by the Bureau of Reclamation in 2007. The Upper Basin states have their own DCP as well, and they're linked with the Lower Basin DCP. There is also a companion shortage sharing agreement between the United States and Mexico, referred to as the Binational Water Scarcity Plan in Minute 323 of the 1944 Water Treaty with Mexico. Modeling done about eight years ago or so has showed a rapidly increasing risk of Lake Mead falling between critical elevations so the Lower Basin DCP was designed to help stabilize the system and reduce the risk of potential catastrophically large reductions in supply. DCP involves a set of collective actions that include increased incentives for system conservation, as well as taking reductions that are larger and begin at higher elevations in Lake Mead. <coughs> DCP was not meant to eliminate, eliminate the chance of shortage overall, so shortage does not reflect a failure of the DCP. It is something that was contemplated and planned for. I'll reiterate what we heard earlier. DCP is a success. As Ted noted, we would likely already be in tier two without the DCP. Ted and I will go into detail about the implementation of the plan, but there is some additional context. And we wanna talk about Colorado River priorities and uses in Arizona. So to understand what shortage means to Arizona, it is helpful to recognize that not all users of Colorado River water in Arizona have the same access to that water. There is an established priority system that protects the most senior rights, including most of the rights along the main stem. As the slide notes, one of the primary distinction is whether the rights were in place before or after September 30th, 1968, which is the date of the Colorado River Basin Project Act, which among other things, authorized construction of the Central Arizona Project. And I'm not going to read through the priorities on the left, but you can all see them I, as I'm talking about the charts on the right. Those charts show recent use rates for rights along the river in blue and for the CAP system in green. Most of the on-river use is for agriculture. So there is some year to year variation there, but it has been in the range of 1.1 to 1.2 million acre feet. The remainder of Arizona's normal year annual entitlement of 2.8 million acre feet is then available to CAP. 
However, when Arizona supply is reduced by the Secretary of the Interior in a declared shortage, reductions in Arizona are made on the basis of priorities. The major, the majority of reductions under a Tier 1 shortage will be absorbed by the fourth priority rights. As the, as the chart shows, a portion of the on-river use is fourth priority, and most of the CAP supply is also fourth priority. These fourth priority rights are co-equal. Under the terms of the 2006 Arizona Department of Water Resources Director's Shortage Share Recommendation, there is a formula that determines the relative share of reductions between CAP and on-river users. Based on the current level of underutilization of on-river fourth priority rights, a Tier 1 reduction in 2022 will fall almost exclusively on CAP. And Ted will discuss the implications of that in a bit. The lowest priority rights, 5th and 6th, will be affected in a Tier 1 shortage and will not receive water under those entitlements in 2022 if we end up in a Tier 1 shortage. Recent use by P5 priority rights has been about 4,500 acre feet per year. And as Dan noted, Reclamation will be coordinating with on-river users and tribes with P4 and P5 entitlements in coming months. And we got clarification recently in a letter from Reclamation noting that they will be following the director's shortage sharing recommendations. The DCP was designed to increase the collective actions among water users in Arizona and Nevada, and it will include California in reductions as well as facilitate increased participation by Mexico through Minute 323 to again reduce the risks of reaching critically low reservoir elevations. Tier 1 is a painful reduction to Arizona and triggers additional uh, contributions from Mexico and Nevada as well. If the reservoir continues to decline, more aggressive actions will be taken by the lower basin users, including California, to slow the decline in the system. There is also a trigger to consult and determine additional collective measures by the Secretary of the Interior and the Lower Basin States to protect against Lake Mead declining below elevation 1020 if the minimum probable 24-month study indicates Lake Mead will be below elevation 1030 at any point over the projected two-year period. Again, that's a very important adaptive management provision that is in the drought contingency plan that sometimes we have not talked about because hopefully that will not happen, but it could. So moving on. Uh, the Lower Basin DCP is an interstate agreement that required the approval of the legislature for the director to sign on to various documents in that interstate agreement. Of course, the governor also had to sign the legislation passed by the legislature. And so to gain the broad support we needed, <coughs> the Drought Contingency Plan Steering Committee was formed. The committee, as you can see on the slide, <coughs> included more than 40 representatives of tribes, cities, agricultural, agriculture developers, environmental organizations, and elected officials and they work collectively to share the risks and benefits of the DCP. Ultimately, the Arizona DCP implementation plan <coughs> received <coughs> overwhelming support, made possible in part due to the willingness of two dozen parties to bring a variety of resources to the table. And you can see on the slide the 24 participants co contributing water funding and infrastructure. Based on the success of that approach in the steering committee process, last year we brought the steering committee members back and formed the Arizona Reconsultation Committee, which will be helping us in Arizona as we negotiate the next set of operating rules for the Colorado River, the drought contingency plan, <coughs> and the 2007 guidelines expire in 2026. So everyone I think knows we're work, starting to work on that, what we call reconsultation process. 
So more about the Arizona DCP implementation plan. The plan itself is comprised of a complex set of interlocking agreements among many parties, but the commitments they made fall within two main categories, mitigation and offset. Ted will discuss the specifics of the mitigation component shortly, but one of the primary resources available to soften some of the impacts of the drought contingency plan reductions is water that was conserved by CAP and CAP water users and was left in Lake Mead. That water is accounted for under the intentionally created surplus program, and you will see several, several references to that that say CAWCD ICS. That conserved water while sitting in the lake helped prop up its elevation and helped avert shortages up until this point in time. So there was a desire to make sure that as some of that stored water, the ICS was used, there would be an offsetting amount of new conservation. Through a unique collaboration among the state, the Gila River Inn community, the Colorado River tribes, and a bunch of organizations through the Environmental Defense Fund, more than 400,000 acre feet of offset will have been created by the end of this year, more than covering the anticipated withdrawal and use of CAWCD ICS. I did want to mention uh, that EDF helped put this together. Uh, there were 13 to date corporations, three philanthropic groups, and two other NGOs that all participated in what we list under the Environmental Defense Fund. So lots of different parties beyond those that showed up on this slide also helped contribute uh, into this offset plan. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ted uh, and thank you for listening and paying attention to what is a relatively new and unprecedented path that we're on in the state of Arizona. Thank you, Tom. As Tom mentioned, uh, if we enter into tier one shortage in 2022, which is what we actually expect to happen, that mm -hmm. the except for uh, priority five and six water rights on the Colorado River main stem uh, within Arizona, uh, the remainder of those impacts will fall on the Central Arizona project. So we're going to dive into um, the impacts of a tier one shortage on the CAP uh, system. So the where we'll start is a discussion of a CAP priority. So Tom had gone through a moment ago uh, the, the priority one, two, three, four, five, and six on the Colorado River. And within the predominantly uh, priority four CAP water, there's a little bit of priority three water, um, but most of it is priority four water. But within that envelope, there is another priority system that exists. And that priority system will determine how reductions will occur to CAP users as we go into uh, tier one and later potentially even lower. And this is, this is one of the features of the 2007 guidelines and the drought contingency plan is that we know in advance based on the hydrological conditions on the Colorado River in Lake Mead, what is going to happen to us. And so we have time to prepare for that. Even it doesn't make it any less pain, painful, but at least we know what is coming. So to illustrate these concepts, we use the block chart that's shown on the, on the slide in which the size of the blocks is proportional to the volume of water that we anticipate to be ordered in 2022. And that is that, that what is shown on the chart represents uh, what we would expect orders to be if we had a full supply, which of course we will not. But it's important to start with what would happen if we did so that we can look at what the reductions will be and who they will impact. We won't know what the final order numbers are, of course, until the orders are actually placed in October. And so these numbers are an illustration. They're provisional. In this chart, the highest priority is at the bottom and the lowest priority is on top. One thing to note is that the names of the priorities sometimes can be confusing because the names don't necessarily indicate uh, the use of the water. For, for example, the so-called NIA priority pool, which is shown in, in yellow, 
um, uh, is used by both uh, tribes and by cities, and not by agriculture, despite the name. Um, on the other hand, the ag pool, which is in that teal color toward the top, that is exclusively for non-Indian agriculture, CEP agriculture. Uh, both the ag pool and the NIA priority pool factor prominently in the discussion that we will move into in a moment because those are the supplies that will be reduced in a tier one shortage. Here is how the shortage impacts will fall under the CAP priority system. Just going straight, uh, but from lowest priority uh, to our highest priority, the 512,000 acre feet combined reduction of between tier one and the uh, additional amount um, under the DCP uh, will be imposed. And you can see that uh, the other excess pool uh, at the top uh, in gray, and of course it's all, all the reductions are in gray, but the, gr the gray over gray is um, the other excess pool. This is water that's available after all the contractual and statutory um, uh, demands are met anything that's left over, it's made available to that pool. That was already has been basically uh, reduced to zero over the last couple of years in tier zero. The ag pool is next. That will be completely reduced to zero. Uh, Pre-mitigation, prior to mitigation, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, under the tier one shortage. And then as you can see, about two thirds of the NIA priority pool will also be reduced pre-mitigation. Um, to lessen some of those impacts and to gain the necessary approval and support for DCP across the state and in the legislature, uh, a number of mitigation commitments were made during the steering committee process that Tom described earlier. And those, those um, commitments and those agreements and those mechanisms were crucial to receiving, re receiving the amount of consensus and support to actually get DCP put in place. So we'll talk about that a little bit. This slide shows um, the uh, mitigation. It's an, it's an overview of the mitigation plan that Tom referred to earlier as one of the two key pillars of the DCP implementation plan in Arizona. And it is an uh, important thing to remember about mitigation is it is by year and by tier. So it depends on what year we're in and what tier we're in uh, to determine what the mitigation will be to the two priority pools within CAP that we discussed a moment ago, the Ag Pool and the NIA Priority uh, Pool, shown respectively in, in teal and maize, I guess is what I would call those colors. I had the 124 crayon set when I was a kid, so I go a little bit beyond primary colors. The mitigation commitments are, are triggered at a tier one, so in 2020 and 2021, we were in a tier zero uh, uh, reduction. We don't call that a shortage. Um, and so uh, because we were in tier zero versus tier one, there was no mitigation in 2020 or 2021. We didn't need that. Um, that's good for, for a couple of reasons, is that water that we might otherwise have used for mitigation remained in Lake Mead, number one. Uh, number two, that means that we will have a, a greater certainty that uh, the resources that have been set aside for mitigation in 2022 going forward will be adequate to meet all of the commitments that have been made. In 2022, there is 100% mitigation of the impacts to the NIA pool. So whatever um, reductions that there will be because of tier one to what the NIA priority pool contractors and subcontractors would otherwise order. Um, if they are cut back, that will be mitigated and they will have their full supply that they otherwise would have ordered available to them. There's also 105,000 acre feet of mitigation to the ag pool. That's about one third of the normal supply uh, that would otherwise be available to the ag pool. So this is a, is a painful reduction, but fortunately because of mitigation, it's not going to be a full reduction right away going into 2022. One important thing to note here is because of the priority system, even though uh, there were many agreements that were put in place to be able to provide these levels of mitigation, it respects the priority system. If, if mitigation is provided, which it is, to the ag pool, um, then the uh, next senior pool, if it is also reduced, 
in this case the NIA priority pool, and it is going to be impacted, has to be mitigated up to its full amount before water can flow to the next lower priority. So that's an important um, feature of the mitigation program and was the subject of much creative work during the formulation of the implementation plans uh, in Arizona. So with those high-level commitments illustrated by this chart in mind, we will now walk through how those mitigation volumes will be achieved in detail. Going back to the block chart, this is how the shortage reduced supply uh, would fill the orders by priority. So what's shown there on the left is uh, uh, reflects a 512,000 acre foot reduction going strictly by priority order in reverse priority order. This is our starting point, and we estimate that there will be about 100,000 acre feet of water available to the non Indian Ag or NIA priority pool. Uh, that's shown in yellow, that's about a two thirds cut, but that still leaves a shortfall of about 150,000 acre feet or so. Filling that shortfall is done using a variety of resources and methods, beginning with water that CAP has in accounts in both Lake Pleasant, which serves as CAP's regulatory reservoir to manage variations in, in, in su supplies and demand during the year, and also in Lake Mead based on water that was previously conserved through the intentionally created surplus program. And Tom referred to this earlier as the, as the ICS or intentionally created surplus that has been already stored by CWCD in Lake Mead and will be a source, a resource for providing mitigation during DCP shortages. This plan also includes utilizing the existing exchange agreement with the Salt River Project. We have shared customers, we being the Salt River Project and the Central Arizona Project, and we both normally deliver a portion of, of um, each other's orders through the CAP SRP interconnect um, and through exchange. In a, 19, in a 2022 shortage or a tier one shortage in 2022 to be specific, we will deliver 10,000 acre feet less through the, inter salt, the interconnect with Salt River Project and SRP will make up the difference to CAP customers. We will then pay back SRP with water when conditions are more favorable. And the 10,000 acre foot reduction to those shared m and priority orders then becomes available to the NIA pool. So, so again, to go over that real quickly, SRP will deliver on CAP's behalf 10,000 acre feet of SRP water to CAP customers, and we will exchange 10,000 acre feet back to SRP uh, later. And there's a reservation of 10,000 acre feet of CAP ICS in Lake Mead as a backstop to that, um, that agreement. The next is what we call compensated mitigation, which refers to a payment in lieu of scheduled wet water deliveries. So some folks that will, that, that will be reduced in the NIA priority pool have agreed to take money compensation uh, rather than water compensation, but it still is, is mitigation. By agreement, the bulk of that compensation will go to the Gila River Indian community, and we expect to update the amount of, of that compensated mitigation over the next month. There's a range that's specified in the contracts and there's a careful balancing act between the mitigation water resources that are being delivered and the compensated mitigation that is being paid so that there is a neutral impact on the CAP rates from both of those mechanisms. Uh, so we, we will finalize that, uh, that exact number over the next couple of months. So the numbers that were shown in this chart are examples. The last category of mitigation shown in the table is firming which refers to the commitment made as part of the 2004 Arizona Water Settlements Act to increase the reliability of certain NIA priority supplies. The state of Arizona acting through the Arizona Water Banking Authority is currently responsible for firming up to 15,000 acre feet of NIA priority water allocated to the Gila River Indian community and the Bureau of Reclamation has responsibility to firm up to 28,200 acre feet of NIA priority water for the Tana Atham Nation. Satisfying these obligations will occur by accounting for previously stored 
or delivered water. So even the explanation, we've made this as simple as possible, but I think everybody understands. And this is just one of the many, many these are just three of the many, many, many pieces. Um, and they're, they're, quite, they're quite complex. They were quite creative. And now it's time to implement those. The net result of all of what we've spoken to on this chart is that almost 150,000 acre feet of mitigation, which is the amount that would be otherwise shorted to the non-Indian Ag Priority Pool, will result in the NIA pool to be fully satisfied or fully mitigated. And then having done that, we can proceed in, pr in priority order to the next lowest pool, the ag pool. So the mitigation of the ag pool parties is like the NIA priority pool, as we just discussed. Um, uh, the mitigation is from a variety of resources, starting with new groundwater infrastructure. The 16,500 acre feet shown in the table and referenced in the earlier illustration on mitigation a couple of slides ago is part of a commitment of money from the state of Arizona, the Central Arizona Project, the federal government, and the ag districts themselves to develop 70,000 acre feet of new capacity from new and re rehabilitated wells that will be pumped pursuant to those ag districts grandfathered right to, to pump groundwater. It doesn't show up in the block chart because it's not CAP water, but it is part of the mitigation for the reduced ag pool supplies. The next mitigation supply for the ag pool is CAP water that a number of cities, private water companies, and industrial users have agreed to redirect, mostly to three large irrigation districts in Pinal County. This water that would otherwise have been delivered on behalf of these cities, private water companies, and industrial users to a recharge basin or underground storage facility in Phoenix and Tucson will instead go to irrigate uh, land in these Central Arizona agricultural districts. districts and um, irrigate, but also create long-term storage credits as the, the um, uh, deposits into recharge basins would, would have done. This innovative urban to agriculture arrangement also involves an exchange of recharge credits held by the Arizona Water Banking Authority. And this is so that those contributors will end up with the credits in the active management area or AMA in which they otherwise would have received credits by doing what they normally would do instead of delivering their water to these ag districts. So lots of moving pieces, very innovative and creative uh, approach um, with lots of folks involved and a bunch of little pieces adding up to uh, meaningful amounts that make this type of thing happen. And the final part of the ag mitigation involves the delivery of CAP water to the irrigation districts by using some of the CAP mitigation water that was previously conserved and stored in Lake Mead as intentionally created surplus. So this is similar to a portion of the NIA priority mitigation that we talked about a moment ago. The combination of these resources mitigates about a third of the impact to the 300,000 acre foot ag pool. So 105,000 acre feet will be restored for delivery to the ag pool out of the 300,000 that they otherwise would be reduced along with a full restoration of the non-Indian ag pool. So that's, that's quite an accomplishment. In aggregate, this is about 350,000 acre feet of mitigation in uh, 2022 in a, if we're in a tier one. So here we have on this slide a before and after version uh, that shows all the various moving pieces. And there's lots of little rectangles um, uh, on, this, on this slide that show, uh, and lots of squiggly arrows that show all of the, not even all, a summary of all of the moving parts uh, to, to put this in place. Um, and uh, while it doesn't fully restore supplies or mitigate all of the pain, it goes a long way and it allows us to move into uh, deeper levels of shortage on the river uh, with all of the water users participating in a way to share the benefits of a more stable uh, and predictable system and the, um, the the pain of having to, to take less water within Arizona. So Ted, I, I agree with what you just said and I wanna also add, 
as important to reiterate how many parties brought resources to the table, including financial resources. CAWCD committed up to $60 million for mitigation, plus $5 million directly for the CEP Ag districts. <coughs> the state is contributing $9 million for grants for the irrigation districts, and another estimated eight to $9 million from the groundwater withdrawal fee in Pinal County, as well as $20 million in loans from state funds. The agricultural districts themselves committed at least $5 million of their funds, and the Arizona Water Company committed $2 million of their funds to this program. So again, as we like to say historically, when issues around water face the state of Arizona, folks put aside their differences, come together, and this is a prime example. And it was very complicated, as Ted described. But again, we like to think we find ways to take care of ourselves collectively. So um, this slide illustrates something that we touched on briefly uh, in, an, in an earlier slide, the fact that we were in a tier zero reduction in 2020 and 2021, and therefore did not need to use any of the mitigation resources um, that, uh, that otherwise we would have, would have used. At the same time, during 2019, 2020, and 2022, the offset program was in, was in full gear. And on the one hand, we were not using in 2020 and 2021 any mitigation resources, particularly ICS out of Lake Mead. And the offset program was already replacing the, uh, the ICS that is, in, that is expected to be used over the full period between now and 2025, uh, putting that water back basically in advance. So we had that double benefit in 2020 and 2021. And that is what is shown on the chart here. By the end of 2022, we expect to be about 30,000 acre feet above our offset target. So more than the, than the 400,000 acre feet that, uh, that was planned. And based on our preliminary estimate, CAP will only end up using about 17% of the water that has been stored in Lake Mead, but is available, has been committed to be available for mitigation. We had anticipated we might need to use more of that by now, so it appears that this resource will be sufficient to meet the DCP mitigation commitments in 23 going forward. And I, I just want to add as well, that the offset program also was an instance in which a combination of public and private funding uh, came together in important ways. The state put in $30 million for conservation by the Colorado Indian tribes and the Gila River Indian community. Uh, the Gila River Indian community self-funded the creation of 50,000 acre feet of intentionally created surplus and committed to keep that water in the lake through the end of the a DCP time frame, and about $8 million from the group of corporations, philanthropies, and NGOs coordinated through the Environmental Defense Fund and the Business for Water Stewardship was put on the table, and I mentioned a little bit of that earlier. So again, many different folks coming to the fore, you know, putting their money on the table to help make all of this happen. In an attempt to summarize the material that we've just been through over the last several slides, we've put together a simplified version of Arizona's DCP implementation and how users are affected in 2022. There's a lot going on in this graphic. This is uh, yet a, uh, a, another version of the teacup diagram for, for Lake Mead. Uh, there's a lot going on in the graphic, but it adds additional background of, uh, and is available on CAP's website and it is part of a coordinated effort with ADWR to provide information and resources to the, to the public. That is also where this presentation that, that you're listening to right now and the video from this meeting that we are recording will be posted um, on CAP's website and also on the ADWR website. So before we take questions, so we're at the end of the, end of the, the formal presentation here, um, uh, 
uh, we will return to the schedule that we showed earlier and a few dates uh, to keep in mind. On June 24th, CAP will be hosting a customer workshop, which will include updates from parties that are participating in the mitigation effort. I might point out, so that's in the first red circle or oval there uh, toward the end of June. We will be doing that. Um, in between now and then, you see in the, in the green letters, uh, it says that ADWR and CAP individual and group stakeholder engagement will occur. So this is what we referred to earlier is that Tom and I and our teams will be meeting with all of the folks that are involved in the, the many arrangements and agreements that we have covered at a very high level during today's briefing to remind them um, what, what it is that we've all agreed to do and make sure that they're prepared, everyone is prepared to do so that this works the way that it was intended to work. And we're confident that that, that is going to happen. On August 25th, after the release of the August 24 month study, which again when the, is when the official uh, determination will be made about the Colorado River supply for 2022 and whether we will be in a tier one or not, we, meaning um, uh, CWCD, will be holding our annual water users meeting. We do this every year, whether there's a normal supply or not. It will probably be even more important uh, this year because we anticipate a, a shortage. Uh, people will start with uh, orders that, um, and you'll hear this at the August briefing, start with their orders as if there was a normal supply because that will become the basis then of uh, what will actually be available to them and what the mitigation uh, amounts will need to be. And on October 1st, as it is every year, uh, water uh, orders for CAP are, are due. And there's, there's other milestones on this chart that I won't go into uh, uh, right now, but they're, they're, this is part of the, of the briefing materials that will be posted and will be available on CWCD and ADWR uh, websites. So now we would uh, like uh, to, to remind you that you may submit questions. We'll begin taking those in a moment. Uh, to www.cap-az.com forward slash shortage feedback. Um, and uh, we'd like to make some closing remarks now before we move, move to questions. Or were we going to do that after questions? I don't recall. Questions first and then, okay, I'm being reminded. Questions first and then we'll make our closing remarks, I guess, when we close. I guess that would make sense, right? Okay. Okay, so let's uh, let's move to questions. We've got uh, we've got a team of folks here that are that are fielding questions. I'm I'm seeing we're using um, sign language. There's one. Uh, it has been uh, uh, given to Tom for a response. So the the question is, what are we doing to support water conservation? Uh, and the premise, I guess, is that the historically low cost of water in Arizona deters investment in efficiency measures. So I want to say several things about that. First, I want to distinguish between conservation and curtailment. There's often confusion there. So curtailment occurs when uh, your demand outstrips your supplies. Curtailment is kind of like the hare in the tortoise and the hare story. Conservation is like the tortoise. You do it every day and you do it over a long period of time, you become more efficient and those efficiencies in conservation become permanent and baked into your processes. We do not need to do curtailment in the state of Arizona. Ted talked about the mitigation plan. So we are mitigating some of the impacts, but you're not going to see a request for people in their homes to only shower twice a week. We're not in that situation. This is not a crisis at that level. We've been planning for this for years and doing conservation for years. Arizona is the only one of the seven basin states that has mandatory state mandated conservation requirements in areas called active management areas, the population areas of the state. CAP water goes to four of the five active management areas in our state. Those areas were created as part of the 1980 Groundwater Management Act. That act required, again, conservation for the municipal, industrial, and agricultural sectors effectuated through a series of management plans. Uh, DWR is currently working on the fifth of those five management plans authorized in 1980. 
the law requires that increased conservation or reductions in groundwater withdrawals occur incrementally on each one of those plans. And just as an example, yesterday my department, DWR, uh, met on the fourth management plan with the golf course industry. There were over 400 people in that virtual meeting. Uh, we discussed different possibilities for their conservation programs in the fifth management plan, but we also gave them at the start of that meeting a very brief but similar presentation that you heard here about what's happening with the Colorado River, the reductions facing Arizona, to give some context about why it's so important that all of the sectors in Arizona continue to meet the conservation goals and requirements set up by my department through the management plans. I'm seeing we, we have not received any other um, questions um, for, for today. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, that uh, you can't ask any more questions, that we're always, uh, ADWR and CWCD are always interested in your feedback, your questions. So as we mentioned earlier, today's briefing is being, is being recorded. And uh, as folks watch that, if, if, uh, if uh, questions or comments come up, uh, you can contact us. And, uh, and ask those questions. Well, we, we've, we managed to stall enough to get one other question come in. And uh, Patrick is, is bringing it over right now. I think you, it's my turn. Yeah, your turn. Okay, it's my turn. Um, the question is, you talked about how part of the ag mitigation will come from urban to ag transfers. Are these cities creating long-term storage credits through groundwater savings facilities? And um, Yes, as a matter of fact, and this, this uh, commenter is actually using all of the technical terms that, that we uh, avoided, I think, in our explanation, but this is technically is very accurate, is that this urban to ag transfer is the cities and towns, industries, and private water companies have for many years on their own uh, been storing por a portion of their CAP water supply uh, underground in a uh, underground storage facility or recharge project that are built deliberately for that purpose. And when they do that, they earn a long-term storage credit that can be recovered or exchanged or used in some other manner in the future. So this, this in itself is a, is, a, is a method of conservation. In the urban to ag transfer, what will happen is that those cities, towns, industries, and private water companies will have their water delivered that they otherwise would have delivered to an underground uh, storage facility, or USF, to a groundwater savings facility, or GSF, which is an irrigation district that uses that water delivery for irrigation. They still earn a long-term storage credit, but it's in a different location than where they would have earned that credit if they had stored in a, an underground storage facility in their own active management area. So that's where the water bank comes in and will exchange the credits that are earned in the groundwater savings facility for credits that the water bank already has in the AMA where those contributors would have earned their long-term storage credits. So multiple steps in the process of doing this. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, Tom and I share the view that this is not only innovative, but also um, uh, uh, very beneficial to have these uh, cross-sector uh, transactions that helps to make this work uh, for everybody so that we can we can all get behind this program and make it work thank you for the question so Ted, I, I'd like to add a couple of things to what you said so people are aware when those long-term storage credits are created 5% of the water they put in the ground is left behind as a quote-unquote cut to the aquifer so there's a benefit to the aquifer itself from the, the creation of those long-term storage credits. And then segueing back into the first question about conservation, folks often ask, what is the benefit of me conserving water in my house, in my yard, et cetera? Ted mentioned these urban entities being able to create these long-term storage credits. The folks that they serve by conserving water reduce the overall demand for that entity and give them the flexibility to take that water they're not using and put it underground, the flexibility that we talked about earlier, 
to do conservation in Lake Mead. Some of that's agricultural, but there's some municipal there as well. So conservation perhaps isn't uh, reflected quite as easily in people's eyes in terms of what the benefit is, uh, but that is a huge benefit uh, created by the conservation that, that folks are doing in our state. We have another, qu another question that has just come in. So Ted, this next question we probably both want to take a turn answering, but I'll start, I suppose. And the question is, do you anticipate any lawsuits filed by water users after shortage amounts slash cuts are announced? And what will the, the division and the CAP do to prepare for litigation? So one never knows if litigation is going to be filed, but in the presentation, you heard the word priorities many times. Uh, the way this plan was put together, uh, we are honoring all of the priorities. No one is being cut out of priority. Um, we honored in the steering committee process the priorities, and part of the reason there are so many interlocking agreements and it's so complicated is to find a way to honor the priorities. I don't expect any uh, successful lawsuit challenging the shortages because we are following those priority system uh, the contracts, the laws, et cetera, within the state of Arizona. My department, if there is a lawsuit that we would be involved with, uh, would be ready. I have attorneys in my department that would attend to this type of lawsuit if it is filed against DWR. And I'll turn over and let Ted probably complete the answer to this question. Yes, thank you, Tom. I do, I do have some, uh, some comments there. So as Tom said, um, obviously there's no way to predict whether or not someone will choose to pursue their rights um, that they believe that they have under the law to, f to file a lawsuit. Um, that, that being said, um, I'll echo what Tom said as well, is that there are priority systems and all of the CAP contracts and subcontracts are subject to availability of water. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I'll avoid using legal terms. Um, and ultimately, the Secretary of the Interior is the master of the river on the lower Colorado River. So the Secretary will determine and has an overriding, um, there I go using legal, legal term, or quasi-legal term, has an overriding authority to determine what the availability of water in the lower basin is, notwithstanding the contracts and subcontracts that are in place. The, the, 2007 guidelines and the drought contingency plan were put into place so that water users, including the, the three lower basin states, would have some certainty that as uh, Lake Mead suffers from ongoing drought and climate change, what would happen at certain levels in that lake rather than finding out every year what the secretary was going to decide to do with little notice or time to plan or prepare for uh, what the reductions might might be. So I, I think I wanted to provide that context of uh, what availability means and, and contracts having a water, um, uh, a va water is being provided subject to availability even up to the highest level of priorities in the CAP. We have another question, maybe more than one. Um, this one. Are the rough firming numbers for each entity being firmed available? Um, they, they are not at this present time, but we expect as uh, water orders come in. So this will be in the, say, August to mid-October time frame, and we'll be having those discussions and getting a better idea about what water orders to expect and how much firming will be required based on the supply that we have. And again, lots of moving pieces. Okay, so I'm being, I'm being told, uh, as we mentioned earlier, that the NIA pool will be reduced by about 60%. It will be, it will be mitigated and firmed uh, up to full availability. So any reductions um, into the NIA pool will be, will be uh, uh, restored to 100%. Now, what that number is for each individual entity, we don't know at this point in time. Certainly, I don't know. Um, at this moment because we don't know what those entities might order, whether it's their full amount, I would expect so. 
uh, or or not. Um, but uh, those those that will be that will be clear as time goes on. I think the important thing for people to remember is in the non-Indian ag pool, um, or the NIA priority pool rather is what we should be calling that. Um, that those um, those uh, water those contracts and subcontracts will be mitigated and or firmed up to their full amount, whatever that is. So Ted, the next the next one isn't a question, but it's a reminder to folks out there. Uh, that entities involved in the urban to ag mitigation if you do not already have a water storage permit you will need to file an application for that water storage permit for the correct uh, facility or gsf groundwater savings facility uh, we need obviously time to process that so it's more of a heads up to folks out there if they have not already done that please do that so we can uh, start processing those uh, applications for the water storage permits. Again, it's DWR that tracks uh, the accounting for the creation of the long-term storage credits. Uh, so we need these water storage permits to help us do that. The next question is, what are the implications for farmers who grow in the various CAP ag districts in 2022 and beyond during tier one specifically regarding their ability, their ability to receive water deliveries. So I'm interpreting this question to mean to receive CAP water deliveries. So the implications are, again, as, as we, I think, uh, outlined in our presentation today, the size of the CAP ag pool is 300,000 acre feet. Um, Strictly going by per, by uh, reverse priority order, the, that 300,000 acre foot pool will be reduced to zero. However, through the mitigation programs in 2022 specifically, that 105,000 acre feet of that will be restored through mitigation programs. And we discussed that there's three of those. So one of them is uh, beginning to, to enjoy the um, increased pumping capacity through the uh, ag infrastructure work that has been funded by a number of parties. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. The second piece is this urban to ag transfer that we have discussed in some detail this morning. And then the third is an amount of CAP mitigation water that will be released from Lake Mead and delivered to those ag districts in 2022. After 2022, the the um, there is no CAP surface water mitigation available for the ag districts at all, uh, regardless of the tier. If we somehow pop back up in t into tier zero, which is unlikely, but it could happen theoretically, um, there would be um, ag uh, pool water available again. But assuming that we'll we'll remain in tier two or lower, there is no again CAP uh, surface water mitigation available to the ag districts. However we expect that there would continue to be this urban to ag transfer or USF to GSF transfers would continue to be available at some, at some level. And that also that the, uh, the ag districts would um, continue and, and complete uh, the up to 70,000 acre foot of new ag infrastructure program that's being funded as part of a DCP implementation plan in Arizona. And last but not least, these ag districts have a grandfathered groundwater right, even without the new infrastructure, to continue to pump groundwater. Um, I don't think anyone um, expects that the ag districts necessarily will be able to completely replace through groundwater their, the, the reduction of the ag pool. That remains to be seen, I think, and it's really a kind of up to each ag district and their economics about whether or not and to what extent they will make that work. Um, so I, I believe that I've, I've um, answered what this question was getting at. I hope so. And I don't know if Tom has anything to add on that. He's saying no. Just had that in the steering committee process when we talked about the mitigation plan. I seem to recall, and hopefully this is in the right ballpark, that the agricultural entities were talking about even with the mitigation plan, they might have to reduce their acreage by 30 to 40 percent. Is my recollection of the number? Um, so, for what for what that's worth, 
and again, like you said, it will be different for each irrigation district. They have different access to different supplies. So we do have another question. <clears throat> Are additional conservation measures being considered for municipal users, parens, homeowners, for uses such as landscape irrigation? So the mandatory municipal conservation programs effectuated by my department, uh, the requirements are, is for the municipal provider to meet uh, those conservation requirements, and we leave it up to the municipal provider to determine how to meet the requirements. So I, I am not aware that any municipal provider is going to uh, ask for those types of restrictions. In my mind, those are more in the curtailment zone than they are conservation. But I will say this, uh, based on uh, knowledge from my former life, all of the municipalities are required, again, to have drought management plans. They have triggers, uh, and the, tr the first trigger is really linked to any reduction in their renewable water supplies. In this case, CAP, some cities have Salt River Project water. In 2003, the Salt River Project cut its allocation because of drought uh, in their watersheds. And the city of Phoenix went to stage one of its drought management plan, which was a re required 5% reduction by the city entities themselves, so the city buildings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there was no need from a water supply standpoint for Phoenix to do that. They had plenty of water to meet all their demand, but the city decided to do that to create uh, a buzz around the fact that we were in a drought. We didn't know how long it would last. We wanted to do something optical uh, so that people saw things happening, like turning off the fountains at City Hall. People would go by and say, what's going on? Why is that fountain off? Well, we're in a drought. The drought could last 30 years. We don't know. In that situation, Salt River Project filled up in less than a year from a lot of rain and snow in the winter. And, and the Phoenix moved away from drought one or stage one of its drought plan. So there may be some cities who during the shortage decide, you know, we want to start preparing. The drought might last for another 20 years, as we've already seen the first 20. So it's up to the cities, though, to, to put into place those types of uh, homeowner restrictions. And the cities, under their drought management plans, have ordinances in place, I believe, that give them the authority to do those, take those kinds of actions with their homeowners. So, gentlemen, we're at, the, we're at the end of the uh, the questions that we've received. Okay, so so I'm being informed that we do have a couple of other questions, but um, we are going to cover those. They're from, I, I assume, the media, and so we're okay. So we're gonna we're gonna cover those in our in our press event that we have after this meeting is over. So we appreciate um, everyone. Uh, I don't know what a count is. I'm sure I could get it from someone here. What a count is about how many folks that we have viewing us on uh, on, on uh, the live stream for today. But I expect that it is um, uh, just as um, engaging as similar events that we've had in the past, of, of probably in the order of a couple hundred people that are viewing this. I'm guessing. And thank you all for your attention and your interest in, in this topic. Of course, um, uh, while we're working very hard on this at CWCD and ADWR, as you probably gathered from our presentation today, it takes effort and, and commitment by lots of folks throughout Arizona, the water, and not just the water user community, but elsewhere uh, to make these things happen. And it will really be tested here as, as we move forward and actually have to implement it. Um, considering that we have been preparing for shortage for decades, we are implementing this plan that we've referred to developed by Arizona Water Leaders in 2018 and 19 to share resources to reduce the pain from the Tier 1 reductions. And we will continue to work together through the Arizona Reconsultation Committee that Tom referred to earlier to address the larger risks that we face in the future. And the, again, the Arizona Reconsultation Committee is one of the tools that we'll use in Arizona to support the state of Arizona's efforts in um, helping to formulate the next set of rules for managing the Colorado River after the 
2007 guidelines expire in 2026, MDCP. There is a tentative date for meeting number three of the Arizona Reconsultation Committee. That is on May 26th. We expect to send meeting information out uh, to delegates uh, next, early next week to save the date in RSVP. And then there will be postings on CEP and ADWR websites uh, once, that, once the time and date for that is uh, finalized. The 2021 Joint Recovery Update that will be issued by the Recovery and Planning Advisory Group, or RPAG, um, and the next meeting of the RPAG is on May 11th at 1 o'clock. Arizona Water Bank Authority credits are a part of the shortage mitigation plan, and so interested parties in how all that works um, are invited to, um, to uh, view the RPAG meeting on May 11th. Also, um, this topic, preparation for shortage, will be the subject of a Horizon interview. That's a PBS program. Unfortunately, during, uh, during a virtual meeting um, format that we are all in right now, hopefully not for much longer, um, they only were able to provide for one of us between me and Tom. We try to do everything we can together. It's so important, um, us working together uh, to, to make all of these things happen. Uh, but it's only one of us, and I was a lucky uh, straw um, on that one. So that will be on the evening of May 11th, so you can tune in for that. So we'd just like to remind everybody, and I'm sure Tom will have some closing comments too if I haven't used up all of our script, um, that uh, in Arizona uh, we have a plan. There, there, is, um, there is a climate change, there is shortage, but we have a plan. It's called the Drought Contingency Plan. We're implementing that plan. We are already working on the next plan that we need to have six years from now. We're working on that today. We are working on augmenting our supplies, and this is really topics for other days, but that includes things like ocean desalination, uh, reuse, continuing focus on conservation that Tom referred to uh, earlier, uh, et cetera, and we are conserving and uh, our, our supplies, all the little pieces that everybody saves and adds up that it gives us a lot of flexibility, as Tom said, to implement uh, these other programs that are um, significant. So thanks again, everyone, for your attention uh, and interest today. So those last comments, Ted, are the perfect segue for me. We talked a lot about the mitigation plan, the DCP plan. You've heard the word plan a lot. We do a lot of planning on a lot of different water management topics. Ted mentioned some of them, the desal, the augmentation, et cetera. So I wanna make a pitch and CAP has monthly board meetings and committee meetings in between. They are great places to learn what CAP is doing, to hear about the issues, to get updates uh, on many of the water issues facing CAP in the state of Arizona. I would encourage people to follow those meetings closely. Likewise, at the Department of Water Resources, we have many planning functions going on. I mentioned the fifth management plan process. Uh, as part of the drought contingency plan legislation package in uh, January 31st of 2019, Governor Ducey signed an executive order reestablishing his uh, Water Augmentation Innovation and Conservation Council. There are committees there looking at augmentation uh, post-2025 active management area issues, just about every water issue uh, facing the state is going to be vetted or discussed through that council process and the committee. So I encourage you all to look for those opportunities to participate in the CAP board meetings, to participate in the DWR processes. We wanna hear what you have to say. It's a great learning opportunity uh, and I recognize that if you do choose to follow all of those things, it's an overwhelming task. Many, many hours of many, many meetings, but you can pick and choose. Agendas are always posted and they will help you decide what's important to you and keep on top of what is happening. And we need folks to be educated about the real risks, the real challenges, and where we have plans in place and actions in place that are gonna minimize those risks and uh, mitigate the impacts on the water users in Arizona. 
So with that, I'll just say thank you all again for attending. Uh, like Ted said, we don't have a number. I don't think we heard a number for the attendance, but last week in a different venue, the Capital Times Morning Scoop, so-called, uh, this topic was part of that panel discussion. Ted and I were on that panel as well. Um, they told us before the meeting started that 600 people showed up or registered at least for that meeting. So uh, there's great interest in these issues and I am happy to hear that there's great interest in those issues because it's really important for the people in the state to follow what's going on uh, and participate as much as they can in these processes. So with that, Ted, I I'll have, close. I just have one final comment, Tom, and I probably should have said it before. So I just would like to acknowledge all of the outstanding work from the staff at uh, ADWR, CWCD, and of course, thanks again to Dan Bunk and his team from the Bureau of Reclamation. And I would also like to say that um, this fine work is emblematic of all the work that that Tom and I have, have had the, um, the privilege of being involved with uh, across uh, many sectors of water users and others uh, in Arizona over the last several years to get to this point. So our thanks to all those folks too.